Okay, I think we can get started then. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone online today, and welcome to this webinar on access and protection, avoiding putting people at risk. My name is Anherid Lang, and I'm delighted to be serving as your host today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. This is the third webinar out of a series of four organized by the NRC Global Protection Cluster and PHAP with financial support from USAID, in which we're looking at the challenges faced by practitioners related to access and humanitarian protection. So with that, let's turn to the substance of today's event. As mentioned, this is the third webinar in a series of four in which we are looking at how humanitarian protection relates to access. Last month, in our introductory event in this series, we asked you to submit the types of challenges related to access and protection that you are currently facing in your work or that you have faced in the past. We then grouped these by theme and designed each of the subsequent webinars in the series around your examples in order to really ensure that we're focusing on the issues that concern humanitarian practitioners the most in this area of access and protection. So in the last event, we looked at challenges that practitioners face when trying to gain or maintain access for protection. And then we'll focus in today's event on a different set of challenges related to access and protection, namely when humanitarian actors can actually end up putting affected people at risk through their actions and what can be done to mitigate this. So in order to carry out their work for the protection of affected people, Humanitarian actors need access to reach those people with needs assessments and with services, but that access can bring with it negative consequences for those receiving assistance or protection services, for focal points and contact persons, and for communities as a whole. Knowing how to approach and address these potential risks related to access and protection is critical for humanitarian actors. To help us navigate this complicated area. We're joined today by a panel of experts, each of whom brings extensive experience on working on issues related to access and protection. I'm first of all very happy to introduce Mohammed Alao, joining us from Sana'a, where he has been the Protection Cluster Coordinator for Yemen. Welcome, Mohammed. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here. Uh, next, we have Melanie kessmacher wissing Protection Advisor in the Global Humanitarian Team of Oxfam. She's joining us from The Hague. Welcome, Melanie. Hello, and thank you for having me. Our pleasure. And joining us from Nairobi is Sam Jardin, Director for Humanitarian Access with the International Rescue Committee. Great to be with us, Sam. Thanks very much. I'm happy to be here. And as our fourth panelist today, we have Andrea Castorina joining us from Cairo, where he is the Regional Program and Policy Officer working on protection and accountability to affected populations with the World Food Program. Welcome, Andrea. Thanks for joining us. OK. Uh, We'll just make sure before we bring you in, Andrea, that, that your connection is, is working a bit later on. Um, before we jump into the discussion, I would just like to take a quick look at the types of issues that we're dealing with in this session. More than 350 uh, registered participants did complete the pre-event questionnaire regarding issues that you faced in your work, and many of you also submitted specific examples of these. Um, we found quite an even spread in the types of issues that you reported, including the risk of attacks and robbery, risks to focal points, concerns about needs assessments putting people at risk, risks of aggravating communal tensions, and the risk of stigmatizing program participants. And one area that particularly stood out were issues related to affected people having to travel to having to travel to access assistance, uh, with more than half of respondents having experienced this issue in their work. Uh, so we're going to start by looking at situations where the way that assistance is provided or the types of access that humanitarian actors have 
actually expose people to protection risks. This includes the risk of robbery or attacks, as well as situations, as mentioned, when affected people have to travel a great distance to an access point, and that brings risk for them. So before looking at some of the specific examples that participants have submitted, I'd like to first turn to Mohammed. So Mohammed, have you seen this type of, uh, this is a very general um, category of situation. Have you seen this type of situation in practice? And do you have any uh, very general recommendations first for this type of issue before we get into the, the specific examples? Over to you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you so much again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, those risks are actually, they exist in our humanitarian work for sure. And I would like to talk about two very important concepts that we, uh, I would say, we should consider when we deal with that, with the humanitarian work, in order to avoid putting people at risk. The first concept is uh, risk analysis. It's very important that we really try to put some thinking and some time into analyzing what potential risks the people might be facing. And even before implementing our activity or our program, try to see what are the best ways to mitigate those, uh, those risks. We do, sometimes it might be if we do it on a repetitive way or we do it throughout all our programming, we might get very familiar with that. And it might be not necessarily like a snapshot of uh, let's okay let's uh, book ourselves into a room and and try to think of the risks sometimes it might get with time automatic uh, uh, process but it's very important to make sure that we are giving that uh, the, the uh, that consideration it's important because otherwise uh, revoking the risks that might happen uh, it might take even uh, more time and might take even uh, it might create even more risks the second concept that is very important here I would like to highlight is the, the principle in protection mainstreaming of meaningful access. And it's very important here to look at three layers related to that principle. And those layers are the first one uh, is that the people should be able to, to access the service and of course us as a humanitarian actor should be able to, to also access them. And the second, the second layer is that we should make sure that the people are able to receive the assistance that they are entitled to. And the third concept is very important, is that we need to make sure that people are able to benefit. So our job doesn't actually end when we just deliver the aid. We should be able to analyze what are the risks that can come beyond our delivery uh, 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 activity. And we should be able to mitigate uh, mitigate uh, those uh, those risks. So those are two concepts I would say are very important to consider. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Uh, on this uh, first general question, I'd now like to turn over to Melanie and uh, see if you'd like to add uh, any thoughts on this point. Over to you, Melanie. Thank you. Yeah, Mohammed already mentioned the importance of risk analysis, and I think that's a very important point. You mentioned it also, the importance of it becoming part of our regular work. I think that's really a critical point, um, because otherwise it might feel like an additional burden that we have to do and find time to. So just including risk analysis discussions in our regular team meetings um, or so meetings with communities, um, so including it in, in regular activities we already do, I think is a really good point. Um, so I mentioned um, including communities. I think it's really important that they um, participate actively in our risk analysis. Of course, in the first phase response, um, the first 72 hours, we might have to start with just doing a risk analysis in our own team. But as we move forward, it gets increasingly important for community members and affected people to be involved in that risk analysis because they know best which, which risks they're likely to face. Um, but also, what are the best ways to overcome those risks? Um, and the last point, maybe, um, we could spend lots of days probably doing risk analysis for one particular activity. Um, of course, we also want to go ahead and do the activity if it's, if it's possible. So the good thing to do is also try to keep it simple um, and prioritize the risks that we and others think are, and the, I think the people think are the most harmful ones and like the risks. So the process doesn't, um, doesn't get too big and takes over the whole, all of our efforts.
Perfect. Thanks so much, Melanie. And Andrea, did you want to come in on this as well? Yes. Uh, first of all, good afternoon and apologies for uh, before. My, I had some issues with the microphone. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, yeah, thanks for having. Very happy to join this conversation. And then, yeah, on this point, uh, just maybe, uh, just to um, maybe unpack a bit the um, the importance of involving communities in risk analysis. So we are talking about participatory. Uh, risk analysis, uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, I think it's extremely important in this session to uh, understand uh, uh, the different uh, levels of risks that different people uh, uh, might be exposed to. So uh, we need to unpack the, the idea of risk and, uh, and the uh, fact that different people are uh, exposed to different risks. So this is very useful to uh, basically come up with ad hoc, uh, basically ad hoc solutions for uh, particularly at risk individuals and uh, also uh, we would be able to um, build on the experience and, uh, and the insight uh, of the uh, views of, of people uh, and particularly exposed people to find uh, basically mitigation measures, prevention and mitigation measures. And oftentimes these, uh, these solutions are available within the community. So uh, having uh, this uh, community-based uh, approach and uh, involving uh, communities in participatory risk analysis uh, can um, allow us to come up with very innovative solutions that are available in the community. And for example, when we talk about movements uh, to and from distribution and uh, risks associated with, with, with this, um, there are sometimes uh, solutions that, uh, that are, are there, are available for uh, particular at-risk groups. I'm just thinking about, uh, um, for example, body systems, uh, patrolling uh, along the route, uh, or safe accompaniment to and from the distributions, or for people with specific needs in terms of limited mobility, uh, there, are, uh, there is sometimes a possibility to arrange porters or proxy receivers of assistance. So there is a really a, a wide range of possible um, local solutions that sometimes are not uh, really uh, visible to us, but involving uh, um, the uh, people at, the people themselves, I mean, who know uh, better than, of course, us, what are the, the barriers, the risks that they face, so we can perhaps uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, the most uh, suitable and relevant uh, uh, solutions to prevent or mitigate these risks. Over. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'll just jump back over to Melanie. Uh, I think you want to come back in with an additional point? Yes. Um, maybe for those among us who are managers or advisors and not doing direct implementation as such as, uh, uh, as us going out actually to affect the people, um, there's of course also a way we can support this process. Um, which is by having open discussions and opening the acknowledging um, that there are of course risks involved in what we do in and just by being present in, in the field. Um, and I think that can create a really good space for our teams to have that discussion and acknowledging and openly discussing about the risks they might be seeing or feeling could exist um, and create that space um, to then also engage around identifying measures. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So this has been a, a great, uh, I think, introduction to the general area um, that we're talking about here. I'd like to now get into some of the specific examples that participants in the webinar shared uh, beforehand so that we can look uh, at some more practical situations in, in detail. Um, so yes, we'll be looking at a selection of these challenges, uh, asking our panelists what advice they would give to practitioners in these kinds of situations. We'll start with an example in which the way that assistance was targeted created concerns in certain types of households. Uh, so we have the example up there on the screen. This is coming from someone working with an INGO. Uh, who writes, in a context where we serve many female-headed households, a household without any male members expressed fear about being targeted for theft or attack by other people in the community for receiving shelter assistance. Now, to comment on this situation, I'd like to turn first to Mohammed. You have the floor. Uh, thank you again. I mean, this example is very important to, uh, to, to help us looking into, so to go back a little bit to the risk analysis, 
it's very important that we do that risk analysis with, uh, uh, with taking into consideration gender, power dynamics, social status of the people that we work with. So it shouldn't be only one risk, general risk analysis that we believe the mitigation measures might help everyone in the community. Actually, we need to break it down. We should know, we should know who might be at a higher risk from the others and then adapt our mitigation measures based on that. It's very important as well is we don't approach uh, uh, the mitigation measure in a way that everyone can be vulnerable in, in the community. We should consider how we analyze the vulnerability of the people in a specific context who might be vulnerable in South Sudan, might not necessarily be in, in Iraq, for example, and that's very important. We, we, we brought that micro lens into that. And also to go back to what Melanie and, and Andrea also mentioned and, uh, and, and complimented on this, when it becomes part of our normal programming, it's very important then that we make sure that the people that are in the front line are part of that analysis. People that know the culture, for example, a female, female head of household might be, uh, might be at higher risk inside one country but different from one area to another even. And that's very important to look at that. And my last point on this specific example is, it's also very important to see who can be, uh, uh, let's say, our allies in a community, who can we rely on, work with to mitigate those risks. Uh, uh, when, when, when a female head of household might be at higher risk, it means that we might be able to have some sort of community structure that we can work with to improve that, some sort of uh, community-based uh, women groups, for example, that are able actually to support us in, uh, in this. Over. Very important points indeed. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, we'll now turn to a second example. This is coming in from South Sudan, submitted by someone working with a UN agency there, where Access only allows for delivery in specific locations, forcing affected people to travel to collect assistance. So our participant writes, in South Sudan, where access to most of the affected communities was hindered by insecurity from different armed groups, protection services, including assessment and distribution, were provided through mechanisms including rapid response missions, RRM. During this period, one or two villages are selected as meeting points where people from all other villages will have to come to avail of services. This means that vulnerable women and girls, including persons with disabilities, have to travel long distances and even at night to collect assistance and return through unsafe routes. So I'm turning back to you, Mohammed, for your thoughts on, on this um, different but related example coming from South Sudan. Back to you. Yeah, unfortunately, emergency response in South Sudan is happening, is taking place now for, uh, for too many years. But at the same time, there might be the, the positive side of that that we have learned. Uh, I mean, for that, for, uh, let's a little bit look into a general, uh, 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 to, to look at that from a general point of view before we, we, we look into it uh, from South Sudan. But like, it's also important to, to revisit and rethink our way of doing emergency response in the humanitarian sector. Uh, and every day or every year, unfortunately, the, the, the conflict is being so much, uh, is becoming so much decentralized at a very micro level. Inside one country, you will have different areas of pockets of conflict, and one of them is South Sudan. It's very important we look into how much we can localize the, the emergency response, how much we can actually work with, 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 with the community itself, how much we can work into uh, uh, through uh, uh, local groups, through uh, local organizations, how much we can actually be able to preposition our materials or our items in the field and, and, and work through that. And it's also very important that since it is a conflict area, we need a continuous conflict analysis. Look into how front lines are shifting uh, and who is affected and what are the safe routes that are left for the people. And also, of course, uh, engage the people in, in identifying those routes. And so in, in this example, particular example, there's already, they already selected they selected a, a village uh, uh, to, to, be, to distribute and people are going there, but it's very important to see if we did the right choice on that and we selected the, the best one. And also it's, it's important to consider uh, uh, 
what are we uh, delivering in that emergency response and how we are delivering that and see where we can actually visit our modality or the items or even if it's a protection, how can we do it in that way. Some of the examples mentioned from Andrea at the beginning, I would like also to recall here because I feel they are relevant. The concept of trying to help if the people need to walk and there will be people with disability or, or, or there might be different people at different uh, level of risk, it's important to look into community structures again. Maybe we'll have casual labors, we'll help the people. Of course, it depends what item are we distributing uh, to the people and how much they can actually carry it back home if it is uh, uh, an asset. Over. Very good. Thanks so much. And I, I see from the comments in the chat and then also some, some comments coming through the, uh, the question uh, line that your reflections are very much resonating uh, with the participants. So thanks so much for, for the analysis and for the reflections, Mohammed. Just a uh, point to our participants. It would be um, wonderful as well if you want to discuss these examples yourselves uh, as well using the chat. And we've also put up a poll in the upper left-hand corner so that you can share with everyone what would be your number one recommendation to a practitioner experiencing one of these situations regarding how to approach a situation where assistance leads to risks, for example, um, as we're discussing now, robbery or attacks or other related risks. We'll post a similar poll for each of the categories that we have throughout the session today so that you can continue uh, to share um, to share your own input and your own recommendations as well. And we'll have all of that then, of course, compiled uh, in the archive uh, as a resource after the event is over today. So I'd like to turn now uh, on this same example, um, turn over to Melanie. Did you want to come in on this one? Over to you, Melanie. Yes, I wanted to underline a point that Moa Matt, Matt, uh, made um, just on this example, especially in the context of South Sudan, where you mentioned we've been delivering humanitarian assistance for a long number of years already, and the need to see how it's going. Um, something that we haven't mentioned yet, but I think um, it's really important that we monitor um, how those, the, those risks evolve and what is happening. So in the specific situation, they are traveling long distances. Um, we're assuming from the example that there is it's unsafe um, and that there is incidents happening. It's important for us to monitor so what is then happening, not just do a risk analysis before the activity, implement our activity, then it's done, but go back as part of the distribution monitoring, as part of follow-up discussions. Um, really look at how did those risks play out, were our mitigation measures effective or not, and rethink for next time. Um, and learn from it, and especially in situations like South Sudan, um, where this comes up, this um, problem comes up again and again, of course. So um, it's really important that we look at it, learn from it, and then adapt for next time. Great. Thanks a lot, Melanie. Um, I'd like to turn now to our next example. This is coming from someone working with an INGO in Nigeria. So we've actually received several examples regarding situations where there are attacks by armed groups after assistance has been delivered, and this is one of, one of those. So the participant writes, in northeast Nigeria, after food distributions, it was observed that there was always an attack at Nagala by non-state armed groups on the community to loot the food distributed. Um, so Mohammed, let me throw this back to you and see uh, if you have any, um, an, any uh, advice uh, or uh, reflections for someone experiencing this type of challenge. Back to you, Mohammed. Sure. I mean, it's very important to ask ourselves in this example a few basic questions. Uh, the first question is, why the people, why the soldiers are doing that? Are, are, will this food be delivered to their people and still they are doing that? Or, or we are talking about an armed group that is completely has no accountability to the people that we are trying to distribute food to. And that will be very important to look at because if it is a completely different uh, armed group that doesn't have, let's say, the community acceptance and doing that, it's, it's very important then to rethink where we are distributing the food, how we are distributing the food. And, and whether other alternatives can work, or even, uh, and, and definitely to consult the people on how can we mitigate such, 
such risk because there might be even a, a more risk if we stop distributing the food, for example, and those are very important to look at. So basic conflict, conflict analysis is very important here. And on and, and the other side, if it is actually, if it is their people, then it's very important here to look at how did we negotiate our way in to distribute the food in the first place. Did we do enough on the engagement? Did we do enough on the advocacy level into making sure that aid being delivered without creating harm on the people, or at least it's delivered to the people that they are in need for for this? I'd say those are the key the key points that I would I would like to share. Unless others also have some other uh, 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 thoughts from their experiences. Over. Thanks, Mohammed. Yes, really important questions. Uh, I think to ask in, in this type of situation. Uh, I know that we have uh, several panelists who want to come in on the next example, so I'm going to move right ahead to example 1.4. This comes from someone working with an INGO in Afghanistan, and it's a situation where we're looking at risks associated with cash assistance. So our participant writes, local criminal and armed groups became aware of cash distributions despite these being organized carefully, people, are re people receiving cash are put at risk or asked for a percentage of the amount received. Now, on this one, I'd like to go first to Andrea. Um, Andrea, you have the floor. What are your reflections on this type of example? Yes. Uh, yeah, perhaps I can uh, try to unpack a bit the, the scenario uh, based on uh, my uh, past experience in Afghanistan. So I, I think like here we have uh, uh, perhaps a mix of different uh, issues. Uh, some issues are related to contextual factors, of course, uh, conflict, uh, presence of uh, non-state armed groups, uh, and insecurity in some areas. Um, another uh, area of uh, concern is the, also uh, the some structural shortfalls of the aid architecture, I would say, in Afghanistan at least. Uh, when I was there, uh, most of the assistance, emergency assistance, uh, was being uh, uh, delivered in uh, um, urban hubs, uh, uh, mostly uh, in under control of the government, but still close enough to con contested areas, and uh, many beneficiaries were coming from contested areas or areas under control of non-state armed groups to receive assistance and then go back to their uh, places of origin, again, under control of non-state armed groups. This assistance was being delivered mostly through uh, government-led uh, uh, structures. Uh, the so-called petition system that uh, uh, is in place in Afghanistan. It's not only uh, related to the provision of humanitarian assistance, but more broadly to uh, uh, services to communities. But humanitarian assistance, again, is uh, provided in China through this uh, government-managed uh, system, which means that the government is uh, uh, directly involved in, uh, in the assessment and in the uh, delivery of assistance. So I think the, all these uh, factors uh, pose uh, huge uh, protection issues, and especially in this context, uh, cash-based interventions cannot be uh, protection neutral. So I think the bottom line here is that uh, it's extremely important to consult uh, people, uh, beneficiaries, uh, on uh, through a participatory list analysis and ask them what is the best and safest way they see uh, to receive assistance, what, which transfer modalities uh, they prefer, cash in kind or a mix, for example, which kind of delivery mechanism they, uh, they prefer. This is uh, cash on site, which means that then they need then to travel back with the cash on, on themselves or uh, vouchers or transfers. Uh, so I mean, considerations like these are extremely important if we really want to find, you know, localized mitigation measures protection-wise. Um, I think here the example um, refers to uh, some sort of regular or ad hoc taxation that is applied by you know, state and groups to people who receive assistance. Another issue is uh, um, the risk of retaliation. Again, in this case, uh, as the government is uh, uh, directly involved in the provision of humanitarian assistance, uh, whether, receive, uh, whether it's involved in the humanita in humanitarian architecture, including beneficiaries receiving uh, assistance from the government, uh, 
sometimes are uh, also at risk of being, uh, you know, subject to retaliation and attacks. Uh, for being, uh, I mean, considered as supporting uh, the government somehow. Uh, and then, uh, again, another issue, and then I stop there, is uh, the heavy, uh, heavy involvement of uh, local authorities and uh, community gatekeepers, including uh, Maliks, uh, community representatives, in assessments and uh, delivery of assistance, which means that we over-rely, and this is a common issue in protection interventions and not only in protection, uh, we over-rely on uh, community uh, leaders, uh, representatives, or alleged uh, representatives and uh, local authorities, uh, uh, which means that uh, this opens uh, uh, to a lot of space for uh, corruption, abusive practices, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes we also fail short in terms of um, betting uh, um, intermediaries. In this case of Afghanistan, uh, uh, most of the cash is, is uh, also uh, provided through vouchers, and vouchers have to be uh, then exchanged in uh, specific shops. Uh, the way that the shop owners are uh, vetted and monitored uh, sometimes uh, uh, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, not enough uh, or we don't uh, apply all the required uh, measures and of course the beneficiaries are exposed to uh, uh, some uh, abusive practices. Over. Thank you so much. Some very important points there, Andrea. Uh, on this, I'd like to also turn to Mohammed for his input. So over to you, Mohammed. Uh, briefly on this, I just like to share that what can be actually useful in any distribution and especially in cash-based interventions or distributions is to break down the process of that because more or less we need to register people, we need to verify, we need to have some sort of community awareness maybe sometimes or sometimes we prefer not to and then there'll be the, the distribution itself and then after that we, I mean by theory, which is it, it's a must I would say, a post-distribution monitoring. So when we consider each phase or each step of the process of distribution and then look at what can happen to the people at each stage, that will help us to, to really know what is the biggest risk to mitigate and which one we need to start with uh, more urgently. I think that can be a good uh, a good way of uh, doing that to break it down into steps and then look into uh, uh, which step is actually has the most high uh, the most risk on the people and then work on that. Usually, it's the physical distribution itself and what can follow when the people want on their way back home, for example. A lot of the risks might be happening if we go back to the attack or the robbery, and that's to go back a little bit on so. And, and I can see a lot of organizations are aware of this right now, where they work with the distribution points, cash distribution points. Uh, sometimes they even change the whole system they have uh, from using a money transfer agency into, into money in an envelope, but of course with some of the mitigation measures. So th there is a lot of things going on, I would say, seeing many different contexts, and it's very important to look and learn on that, especially when it comes uh, to cash-based interventions. Over. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. And over to Sam as well. Sam, could you come in on this one, please? Over to you. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, so, yeah, just a quick point. Um, this, this, was, uh, this is an example that uh, happened uh, in a program I was running in Afghanistan uh, many years ago now. Um, we were transporting cash for a distribution to a village, uh, and it got stolen on the way. Um, so we, and, and obviously the community, obviously very upset about this thinking a few days what we could do. Um, anyway, in the meantime, the community found out who had uh, stolen the money, um, which was robbed from the vehicle and, and, and sent us a letter to tell us this, uh, and that they'd recovered the money. They also added that they were going to burn down the houses of the perpetrators, so um, obviously we advised and, and, and tried to avoid that um, happening. So the, the two points really, one, um, having good relations with the community and, and valuing that and taking time to build it um, can mitigate both risk of something happening but also um, uh, uh, potential uh, mitigation measures afterwards. Uh, and then back to the risk uh, analysis and, and uh, security management, again, not mitigating just the likelihood of something happening but also the impact because when an incident happens, you, you don't want it to get out of control uh, and then generate additional risks to more people or, or, or to access. Um, so that, uh, that planning, security management, preparedness, critical incident procedures and so on, um, being ready to respond to, 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 to risks being realized um, 
you can never uh, eliminate the risk. So make sure you think of the other side as well. Great. Th thank you very much, Sam. And I'd just like also to acknowledge and thank those of you in the chat who are uh, sharing related resources. Um, thanks for that, Paul, and also those uh, who are sharing some insights and some further examples. Maher, uh, Mohammed, thank you so much for, uh, for contributing there. As well as now the, um, the responses on the poll, we've had a number of really interesting points come up um, through the poll, which I'm sure not everyone has been able to read through in detail, um, but uh, that's why we have the recording, so it will be possible to, uh, to see that afterwards. So thanks so much, and do keep that coming as well as any questions you may have for the panelists. Um, I'd like to bring up just one final issue, a specific example, rather, on this issue before we move on to the next one. Um, this is uh, related to how trying to reduce risks from one type of, of access restriction, in this case having to regularly go to a collection point, can actually lead to other protection risks arising instead. Uh, this um, example reads as follows. In order to reduce the number of times that residents struggling with mental health issues had to go to collect their medications, they received three months worth of antipsychotic medications in advance. However, as a result, we observed an increased number of household break-ins. Melanie, can I turn to you for um, your reflections on this particular example? Over to you. Thank you. Yes, of course, from the example, we're not quite sure what the reason was for um, shape, for giving three months rations, but we could very well imagine that it was um, actually a mitigation measure um, to reduce the number of, of frequency of distributions um, of the medication which could maybe put people off risk because the um, distribution would become too predictable. Um, so apparently the, the option was chosen to give the bigger ration um, at one point, um, which then seems to affect to break-ins, maybe because bigger rations were more visible or because um, it was more attractive um, to actually break in um, because there were big, bigger rations to take than if it had been um, more frequent but smaller distribution. Um, I think this this uh, example highlights two important things. Um, one is um, what we do and how we identify mitigation measures. If, um, first of all, we should, of course, involve the community in identifying the mitigation measures. Maybe this was actually the case in this, in, in this specific example, and that's the reason why they moved um, to, to a three-month distribution in one go. Um, because again, as I mentioned earlier, and as Mohamed mentioned as well, um, communities know best um, what the risks are likely to be and what what would be an uh, acceptable compromise or way of mitigation. Um, but this also highlights the need for us to think through the risks that we might be creating with our mitigation measure. Um, we can't just simply stop at identifying the risk and coming up with one mitigation measure, implementing it um, without questioning it. So we have to do, again, a risk analysis, um, also of the mitigation measure that we identify, because um, otherwise we might be creating even worse risks, uh, potentially. Um, and that would like um, to bring in an example that highlights this point as well. Um, we did a research about um, lighting in refugee camps. And the refugees in one camp had identified that the lack of lighting um, was actually increasing the risk of harassment for women and girls when they went to latrines at night. So the first mitigation measure identified, including with, together with refugees, um, was distributing household solar lamps um, so they could use them when they go to latrines at night. But there was only limited number of uh, solar lamps, and they were often being used inside households. Um, it was still quite obvious and attracting attention when someone actually used them, the solar lamp to go outside uh, to the latrine. Um, and so actually harassment didn't stop, it actually continued and for some it even increased because it was even more evident when women and girls went outside at night to, to use latrines. Um, and this is then where the importance of monitoring also, our mitigation measure kicked in. We went back um, and it was identified that the mitigation measure was not working as such, it was actually um, exposing them to additional risks or the same risk continued. And then the, the refugee camp residents um, 
identified that maybe it was better to install a bigger lighting around the latrine, um, making in this situation making it less obvious um, when women were taking household solar lamps. Uh, but again, in other situations that might not have worked. Um, so looking at looking at our mitigation measures, thinking through the possible risks that we might be creating with them, and then monitoring. Um, the effect our mitigation measure is having. Is it working or not? Are we creating new risks and adapting again? Great. Thank you, Melanie. And I see that Brian in the chat has posted a link to the study. Um, thank you so much, Brian. Very helpful indeed. Um, now to Mohammed, uh, could I turn to you on this example 1.5? Any further reflections to add? Now, just one point is very important to consider. Uh, since the example is related to mental health, it's very important to uh, to highlight that men mental health interventions uh, they need even further analysis of what can what risks they can bring for the people. So not only the the, the risk that it brought up here, but also it by nature there might be stigmatization against the people, and it's very important. And we are we, we have responsibility to make sure that. There is already a lot of constraints and blocks for uh, 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 for mental health in in many contexts. So we need a one block less. Uh, uh, so if 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 that risk happening, the people that we we having like more break ins, it might actually stop the people to seek these services, and that would lead even to 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 uh, like uh, uh, to to further uh, risks on the people on their especially on their mental health. Over. Right. Thanks so much, Mohammed. So now we'll be turning to uh, another type of issue. So now we'll be looking at situations when focal points are put at risk. So first to address, address it generally. So we're looking at uh, when we need to work through community leaders or focal points, but our visits and communication with them puts them at risk. So. Uh, perceived as giving power to them, cooperating with the government, etc. So first, taking a look at this uh, set of issues generally, I'll turn first to Melanie for your reflections, and then um, any of the other uh, panelists uh, who would like to come in, I think Mohammed and Sam. So first, over to you, Melanie. Thank you. And we've seen at the beginning of our session in the short survey that was done before the, the webinar that this is that, that this is one of the most striking issues for many of the participants, really important one. Um, to start off, um, I think there's different reasons, of course, why we, we work with community focal points, and it could be community focal points, village leaders, community leaders, um, volunteers, or community groups, of course, um, or community protection monitors. Um, so. Um, I'm including all of those in, in my reflections, not just the individual focal points, but also um, volunteers and so, as such. And of course, the reason why we would be working with them is um, we could be doing remote programming, so it's the only way we have access. Um, we could be, in order to gain access, we need to go through different community focal points. But also, um, because we want to work with community uh, focal points to act actively engage communities, um, give them space to play an active role um, and be sure that, that our assistance is, of course, relevant and, and pertinent uh, to the needs. And then, of course, all community-based programming, including community-based protection work, for instance, um, where we also work through and with um, community members and support them to take initiative. Um, so I'll be looking at all those in my reflections. Um, so when thinking about the risks that focal points could be exposed to as a result of us working with them or them working with us. Um, those risks could come from different different actors and stakeholders. It could be authorities, as already mentioned in, in the um, introduction here. It could be armed groups, it could be it could be criminals, gangs, but it could also be other community members. And that's for a different range of reasons. Um, of course, it could be because of the nature of the work that the community focal points um, do with us. So it could be because it's very sensitive, because they are working on protection issues. It could be because they are um, involved in the targeting for distribution um, to affected people, in which case they could uh, see increased pressure because they seem to have power um, on who gets and not, or not included in distribution lists. But it could, they can also be at risk 
just simply uh, because of the fact that they are seen to be interacting with outsiders, with us, uh, with humanitarians, um, be, be that local, international NGOs or UN agencies. And that for a number of reasons, they could be perceived as um, being an ally of authorities because they're interacting with us and we could be seen as, um, as being allies of authorities. They could be seen as informants as a result. They could be seen as um, holding a certain amount of power. Um, so information is, of course, power, but also the power to include someone in a distribution list. Um, they could also be seen as threatening the position of authorities. Uh, for instance, if we do community-based protection work um, and we engage with community protection groups, um, like the non-protection, which is, of course, normally uh, the primary responsibility of authorities, authorities could feel threatened that those groups or focal points we're working with are taking over their space or their place. Um, focal points could also be seen to be making a personal gain, of course, uh, from the work they're doing. So there's many, many different reasons that could mean that that they are at risk. And the type of risk that we could see could be reprisals, threats of violence, um, could be extortion, harassment, um, arbitrary arrest, and pressure from other community members. Um, or bribery, corruption attempts. So there's many, many uh, different facets to this. Um, so some things that we should take into account when we work with um, focal points and able to do it in a safe way for them, of course, is we should first have an understanding of the community. Um, so what are the power dynamics that exist? Um, who has what power, informal or informal? Um, so also knowing who might feel threatened by whom. Um, because putting any kind of resource, um, and that can be information, it can be a food distribution, it can be cash distribution, um, or, or the power of having outside contacts, um, can of course change power dynamics. And people who are in the power position before they're there might feel threatened because they feel threatened that they lose power in the, the grip. The, the grip. And we also need to look at gender dynamics when we work with focal points, um, of course, Women often um, are in a in a more vulnerable position when it comes to participation in communities, and um, so we need to pay attention to that. And also, if we then include them more proactively as focal points, we need to pay attention how that plays out both at community level and also at household level as well. And conflict dynamics: we need to know what conflicts exist in and around the community and who are the stakeholders, um, because by us intervening in that community. Um, they could also see us as um, changing those dynamics and as a result the, conf uh, the focal points of course also um, changing those dynamics. We also need to know how people are organizing and how they're interacting so we know um, we also know how information flows of course. And then we come to the risk analysis that we've already been mentioning a couple of times now. Um, we need to do a risk analysis with the focal points. Um, because they are the ones who are going to take a lot of risk, potentially. Um, so they are the ones who need to make an informed decision of whether they are wanting to take the risk um, of being harassed by uh, by police, for instance, or not. Um, they Again, they know the risk that they're likely to face, and they can tell us what could be some good way of mitigating that risk. And it should be a joint discussion, because, of course, we might think of a few things that they hadn't thought of, and vice versa. And we should also keep in mind, yes, that the mitigation measure will look, um, isn't, that we'll find might not work for every single focal point. Um, one mitigation measure might work for a male community leader, whereas another one might work for a female recently appointed IDP um, focal point. And um, I think what's really important is then that the roles and um, the roles of focal points and volunteers are really clear in the community as well, because some of the risks also are created because of the misunderstanding or miscommunication about the roles and and the power and the mandate that those focal points have. So there might be expectations that are created between the communities and the focal points that we're working with, um, just because we have not properly communicated what focal points are actually working on. So that's also something to keep in mind. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie, for unpacking this whole issue around the risk of um, uh, focal points being put at risk 
uh, everything from the, the types of risks we're talking about um, to the different uh, means of analyzing uh, the situation, try to, to mitigate, um, mitigate those risks. So thank you very much. I'd like to turn to uh, first Sam and then Andrea for any additional uh, comments uh, and additional thoughts on this um, uh, category of issues. First to you, Sam. Over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this is a, a slight variation, but I, I think the, uh, I, I guess, learning point uh, from it applies uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, the focal points that we've just discussed there as well. So um, sometimes we, 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 we kind of recruit focal points, right? We take focal points onto staff, people who are well connected with communities to do uh, government liaison, community liaison, and, and, and so on. So. I'm just thinking back to early days um, in the Syria conflict or 2013. Um, we were uh, running some programs in uh, some pretty scary places with, with um, hostile, pretty hostile armed groups um, around. So, you know, I was completely dependent on staff uh, and colleagues from the area um, keeping me safe. Um, but there was also a two-way um, thing. Um, some of the team felt that they could handle most things because they were from the area, from the community, and so on. But the situation, the context was being um, radically changed by the armed groups that were coming in um, because they had a vision of society, they had foreign fighters and foreign commanders, and so on. And so people, even though they were from the area uh, and well-connected, um, increasingly found challenges in being able to navigate that. Um, and, you know, I had one chap who went, he said, yep, I can go and solve this, I'll fix this, went and talked to the armed group and came back with some uh, things that we just couldn't deliver um, and basically raised the stakes. And I, I think, uh, as, as realized in, in Melanie's remarks, um, the stakes and the risks in these situations can be very high. They can be deadly. Um, so we, we had to really work through that um, to try and understand the new situation. And, and so I guess the point is whether it's, uh, liaison people you bring on to staff, all working with focal points, not uh, just transferring the risk, assuming that they know everything about how to operate um, in a conflict environment. Conflicts change the context, they change um, social relations, they change the politics, etc. They change who has influence. So don't uh, just assume uh, that uh, uh, focal points uh, can navigate all of that, that, um, that, that, that they um, know all of the risks that they might face. Um, work through it together, uh, understand the situation as it is, um, don't make assumptions, don't just transfer the risk and, and hope for the best, um, share it um, and share the, share the thinking um, as well. So I think that was just the point. Um, don't assume focal points, know everything um, and can manage all the risk on, on their own. Excellent, uh, Sam, and I, I see a uh, yeah, similar point uh, being made in the, in the chat um, from Pooja. Uh, thanks so much, uh, really resonates uh, clearly. Uh, I'd like to turn then to Andrea. Andrea, over to you. Yes, so um, just quickly um, building on what a uh, on very comprehensive uh, overview provided by Melanie uh, about the possible different possible reasons why uh, community focal points uh, can be at risk and uh, narrowing uh, down a bit the discussion uh, as uh, per the um, most recent uh, uh, intervention from uh, Sam, uh, focusing more on conflict, uh, uh, conflict affected, uh, let's say, environment and the sensitiveness of engagement of community uh, focal points in this specific uh, context. Uh, I would like to uh, maybe um, uh, stress a bit some uh, um, considerations related to uh, in engagement of a community-based uh, mechanism uh, around uh, self-protection uh, structures. So let's say here the sensitiveness is uh, by design, let's say, is, is just strictly related to the nature of the intervention. It's a, it's a protection intervention that uses uh, available resources in the community, so community-based self-protection mechanism. Of course, because of the nature and the, of the intervention itself and the level of engagement of community focal points, uh, the level of risk can be uh, exacerbated in these cases. Uh, even uh, though uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, um, I mean, aware of the uh, amount of risk, uh, um, I think it's extremely important to, um, 
to support, uh, whenever possible, such uh, community-based structures around uh, self-protection mechanism. And there are, of course, some uh, practical uh, measures that can be uh, put in place. I would say uh, uh, some of the, these measures can be, for example, adopting a phased approach. So we start smoothly, we start with the less contentious activities, uh, and then uh, once, uh, you know, like we uh, have already established uh, uh, trust with the community-based uh, uh, committees, groups, whatever they are, and uh, we uh, increase our understanding of the local context and the dynamics and everything, then we can maybe move to more sensitive uh, activities. An example can be uh, based on my personal, let's say, experience, uh, uh, supporting uh, protection of education in conflict-affected communities, again, uh, in Afghanistan in this case. We started working with the school-based uh, committees, uh, but of course we didn't start uh, straight away with uh, uh, very sensitive uh, protection uh, uh, of civilians, for example, engagement, advocacy, uh, negotiation, and things like that. Uh, we started with uh, uh, more, uh, I mean, less uh, sensitive activities, such as uh, rehabilitation of school, school buildings, uh, rehabilitation of wash facilities within schools, and, and things like that. But in the meantime, we gained, you know, some uh, more uh, thorough uh, understanding of the context, and we established the, the mutual trust with the community-based structures. Uh, or another, another example can be the use of uh, um, um, child-friendly spaces uh, for implementation of uh, social recreational activities, uh, light awareness raising and things like that before uh, uh, introducing uh, uh, community-based referral mechanisms or light case management um, implemented through community-based uh, uh, focal points for example. Uh, and then another thing would be uh, invest uh, heavily on, uh, on, uh, on the community-based mechanism. So I keep uh, community, as also someone was saying, we should not assume that they, since they are uh, from uh, that uh, place and they are part of the community, then they know how to deal with, with everything uh, and that's it. Absolutely not. We need to invest uh, on, uh, on uh, working with them and uh, keeping them, uh, developing uh, uh, negotiation, for example, and conflict sensitiveness capacities. Uh, and also um, another thing would be uh, to uh, develop together with them context-specific uh, early warning indicators, uh, triggers, uh, and mitigation measures so that uh, uh, we are able to unpack the risk. Uh, together with them, and then uh, we are able to support uh, timely interventions, mitigation measures whenever the risk uh, reach the, 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 the point of, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, extreme risk, let's say, and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and then uh, we need to uh, put in place some, some uh, mitigation measures in that, in that sense. And the last point uh, would be also to agree on uh, conflict-sensitive and safe communication and reporting protocols with them. So perhaps uh, uh, our presence in the community can raise, uh, uh, you know, uh, alarm or can uh, be too visible sometimes uh, or uh, depending on the volatility of the security situation, we might not be seen as uh, uh, positive actors in some uh, circumstances. In this case, perhaps instead of doing on-site uh, visits, uh, we communicate via phone. So the way of uh, interaction and receiving updates and, uh, and reporting can be, uh, uh, um, let's say, conflict-sensitive itself and should be agreed together with the uh, community-based uh, structures. Over. Excellent. Thanks so much, Andrea. Uh, very useful to, uh, in particular, have those examples um, that you shared and some, some very important points coming out of those. Um, now let's turn back once again to Melanie before we get into the specific examples. Melanie, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, just building on two points that Andrea was mentioning, um, one, the need to maybe for a phased approach where we build trust with the community to work on um, protection as a very sensitive measure, uh, topic, and also the need to um, to accompany um, the community-based mechanisms and structures that we work with on protection. Um, I worked a lot on community-based protection um, uh, work with the committees and the uh, one thing that happened a couple of times is where we had um, established that that trust and relationship, the work was uh, going well, we had a clear understanding of risks, and, and the committee had a clear understanding of the risks they were taking and how to mitigate them. Um, and when the accompaniment and support of, of us then 
our team became important is when the context suddenly changed. Um, suddenly there was a change in the control of the area and everything that had been developed and the relationship that had been built, that had been built, uh, were either lost or um, needed to be rebuilt. And um, I think the committees valued having a partner to talk about um, about the changing dynamics and the changing context, um, to not feel alone um, and left alone in dealing with that change and how to, to again, build those relationships and the new trust and see what is feasible and what risk has changed. Great. Thanks so much, Melanie. So then let's turn now to um, a couple of examples. The first one comes from Colombia, from an individual working with the UN agency there, where the interactions between focal points and humanitarian actors risk making them seem more threatening to armed groups. So our participant writes, in Colombia, there were times when visits to community leaders could not take place as this would single them out and increase their risk. We would increase the number of actors working on an issue to reduce the risk to individuals or strengthen the capacity of community leaders using approaches that were not seen as threatening to armed groups. And Melanie, what are your reflections on this example from Colombia? Yes. Uh, so First, looking at, at Colombia at the moment, uh, or the last couple of years, I think um, we many of us um, have read articles um, about attacks against uh, community leaders and human rights defenders. Um, so even though the, the example here doesn't uh, mention which which risk was increasing as a result, um, I think we can all imagine what this could mean. It could be harassment, but it could also be um, the risk of being killed for standing up for the community. Um, so just to remind us of that, that con the context um, in Colombia, um, and this is coming from different actors, um, including armed groups and, and criminal gangs. Um, so I'm um, not quite sure in the example what the community leaders uh, were, were exactly doing or how they were engaging around what, but it could be, for instance, um, that they were, it could be protection monitoring work. They could have been um, uh, providing information on the protection situation in their community. It could have been sharing other information. Um, it could just have been being the point of access um, for the community. Um, but what all of these have in common is that this is an external contact uh, outside of the community. Um, so being able to share information about the, the situation that's going on with an external could be seen in this in the context of Colombia as, um, as a threat to the, the group or the actors that are holding control over resources, for instance, in the area. Um, so that could have been one of the issues here, being for them to be seen, uh, to be touch and in touch with externals and being potentially seen as informing on people or, or informing on the situation. Um, and maybe even calling actively for attention what's going on. What the example is also mentioning is um, that the community leaders adapted their approach to something. Um, so maybe they were actually doing also advocacy work or local campaigning or even national campaigning or negotiating for um, the respect of the community's rights. So that's not quite clear, but it could have been something linked to that or um, really specific protection work as well, quite sensitive. Um, and the example um, already identifies the mitigation risks, uh, mitigation strategies, sorry, that have been identified and put in place. Um, one is reducing the risk to individuals by actually spreading the risk, meaning engaging a bigger number of individuals, thereby the individual becomes less visible, sends less out of the group. Um, and apparently that was one way. They're using the second one we already discussed is using different approaches to their work that we're doing, um, which maybe were less confrontational, more behind the scenes. Um, yes. So some things to keep in mind here is um, the knowing about the context, so knowing for instance, in for Colombia, um, the difficult position that human rights defenders and community leaders, land rights defenders are in, and, and the high level of risk they are taking in that context. And knowing about also conflict situation dynamics in the area, there's many um, smaller groups, uh, the paramilitary groups, and knowing who is where and what interests they have um, in that specific situation, um, and knowing the stakeholders of course, that are around. So um, it seems like our colleague has submitted to the example fit together with the community leaders, a risk analysis um, 
of what their presence and their interaction with the community leaders meant in terms of risks for them and what mitigation measures that they could take. So it shows them really nicely um, how they identify two different mitigation measures and apply them at the same time. Um, and then also maybe they were monitoring um, how it was playing out and that it actually reduced the risk. It seems to be implied here that it did reduce the risk. Um, the way they were intervening then afterwards. Excellent. Thank you for that, Melanie. And uh, another example I'd like to throw your way. This is coming from a local NGO in Indonesia. So we'll travel across the world now. And the second example uh, that we received focuses instead on potential risks faced by focal points due to pressures from the community. So the person who submitted it writes, when distributing humanitarian assistance, we collect data for targeting from the focal points, i.e. the village officials. But then during the distribution process, people who were not listed interrupt the process, and then the focal points have to explain how the data was collected and why these individuals were not listed. Um, even though there was no violence, it was a high tension situation, and the distribution process took more time as a result. So, Mel Melanie, what are your thoughts on this one? Yes, so this is an example where community uh, focal points, in this case village officials, it says, um, were very, very actively involved in the targeting for the for distribution. Um, this could have been done, of course, for a number of reasons. It could have been because of remote programming, um, or it was the way of community engagement and ensuring that the community um, gave their point of view on vulnerabilities in the community. Um, it seems, however, that maybe the process that was um, the way the process that was set up maybe exposed the villages to um, the village officials to pressure from community members. Um, so it maybe it was a case of there not not enough being enough clarity on um, the targeting and not being communicated um, what the criteria were and also what role the focal points were playing, um, or maybe on the methodology. Um, it also um, shows us that, of course, um, being, being involved in the targeting process can, can give um, a position of power to people, and that can also be um, then that can be um, not be accepted. Uh, by other members in the community. So knowing who already holds power and because um, it's village officials, so maybe other groups were left out in the targeting process um, who were not happy. And if we then didn't have a proper um, complaint mechanism or something like that where people could share frustrations or doubts or questions about um, what was going on, um, could lead, lead, of course, to increased um, pressure on the focal point. Um, even more if it was indeed a remote programming and um, the local NGO, I'm not sure if they were able to be present and what level of access um, the community members did have to also the local NGO um, to di discuss about maybe their frustrations or fears or doubts about the targeting process. Um, so the risk analysis should, of course, not just look at the distribution itself. Um, and how we get the information through the focal points, but also how, what we put in place to take the pressure off them. Um, so being clear and transparent about what they're doing and how they're going to do it, um, but also once they have um, shared information on targeting and criteria or even potentially suggestions of the people to receive assistance, um, that all that communication is quite, is quite clear with um, community members and being done in a transparent way, that leaves less room for um, more informal pressure, I would say, or could leave less room for informal pressure if it's being done in a transparent and open way. Um, it's quite clear, and similarly, if we have a, a complaint mechanism where that people can raise um, the discontent with the process and the result, um, and that directs it more towards that mechanism instead of leaving it with the individuals, um, the individual with your focal points who were involved. Great, thank you, Melanie. And Sam, uh, could I ask you to come in on this one as well? Over to you. 
Yeah, I, I think Melanie uh, captured all the key points. I just thought it's worth highlighting in the current um, context, global context, um, uh, where I imagine most organizations on, on this call are operating with some degree of remote management in, in nearly uh, all, the, all the countries they work. Um, and that, uh, so there's great opportunities for around localization and, and, and empowering um, staff in the field and so on. But I think this illustrates that we also need to remember the pressures um, that can be there as well. Um, so uh, ex in, in staff from outside the area or from outside the country uh, may not, uh, you know, often won't know the place as well and, and uh, have disadvantages, but sometimes their they're being there can take pressure off of local people um, because if you come from the outside, you're, you're not necessarily subject to some of those same uh, pressures. You can always leave. People that are from that place have to stay there um, afterwards. So I think this uh, particular example is very well worth thinking through, the pressures that are on people that are currently left uh, in place at the moment uh, while, while others can't travel and are perhaps taking on additional responsibilities. I think celebrate that as an opportunity for empowerment, but uh, support um, support them, I think. And, and things like the, the complaints mechanisms, uh, clear communication with the community. Um, in other places, um, sometimes we've removed the actual decision making from the field location, um, and so in Syria, and, and then had it um, at, at the sort of rear um, uh, office, as it were, in, in Jordan or somewhere, and made that very clear. But also, with that, made sure that there's clear uh, complaints and communication channels um, for redress. And so that's an example, as uh, uh, Melanie uh, put forward, about uh, looking how you can take pressure off uh, people that have to deal with uh, these questions. Excellent. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, so now we'll move on to the third type of issue that we're looking at today. This is when humanitarian programming risks aggravate communal tensions. So uh, when humanitarian actors have access and are targeting the most in need, but this is then further aggregating tensions along ethnic or other dimensions. So for this, I'd like to turn first to Andrea. What would be your main recommendations for someone faced with an issue of this type in general, Andrea? And then we'll get into a couple of examples. So over to you. Right. Thanks. Uh, well, okay, perhaps before uh, uh, trying to provide some uh, uh, possible recommendations, I would say that these uh, uh, intra or inter community tensions uh, can be, uh, let's say, caused or exacerbated uh, due to possible different uh, uh, factors. First of all is uh, how uh, we uh, provide our uh, assistance and our intervention, the how uh, of uh, our assistance and the whom we target. So uh, how basically with uh, uh, being targeted, how we are prioritizing uh, people. Of course, this is uh, um, a huge uh, source of possible tension. Another, um, uh, let's say, typical uh, um, consideration related to uh, inter-community tensions, uh, classically we can refer to uh, mistrust, bias, uh, lack of information or misinformation, competition on limited resources, uh, or also volatile security environment. Um, so these are uh, contexts where we have uh, typically IDPs or refugees uh, and host communities uh, who uh, uh, share the same uh, area, let's say. And uh, a third uh, more general consideration is uh, uh, on uh, um, the fact that, uh, especially when we talk about uh, protection interventions, we uh, should not focus only on the most vulnerable people. I think uh, protection-sensitive interventions are not about only, at least about the most vulnerable, targeting the most vulnerable people, but especially uh, is, uh, uh, are, having, uh, are about having uh, conflict sensitiveness. Uh, so we are looking at uh, peaceful coexistence between uh, communities and possibly also uh, social cohesion. Um, saying that, say that I would say that the first mistake that we often uh, do is to consider communities as a monolithic entity. So uh, we need to understand that communities are not uh, monolithic uh, um, uh, entities. 
we have to unpack the idea and the concept of community. We need to understand the, which kind of groups are within the community, which constituencies, which power dynamics are there, including presence of gatekeepers and marginalized groups, what are possible connectors and dividers within the community. All of this, of course, shape what a community is. So it's a very complex uh, entity. So we need to invest the time. Sometimes we don't have time, but uh, and I, I, I have to say that whenever we rush interventions, uh, it's very likely that this intervention falls short in, the, in this poor in terms of uh, protection uh, sensitiveness. And uh, there is a huge risk of uh, doing harm. So we need to understand communities and make also sure that communities understand us. So who we are, uh, which uh, mandate our organization has, why we are implementing this specific activity, why we are targeting these people rather than other people. Uh, so uh, mutual understanding. We need to understand communities. Communities need to understand us and what we do. It's important to have also the full picture of, uh, uh, of uh, um, the community before providing assistance, meaning we need to uh, disaggregate data when we do assessment uh, along the gen their age uh, um, and diversity lines, of course, uh, looking also perhaps at marital status, economic situation, as uh, uh, much detailed information as possible and disaggregation of data uh, would, uh, uh, of course, uh, help us to uh, uh, have this uh, full picture and uh, uh, plan properly the uh, who, where and what uh, uh, to support. Um, it's also uh, important to communicate properly <laughs> this uh, targeting um, uh, um, criteria and prioritization to communities. We can have the best possible uh, targeting in place, but if communities don't understand why we are targeting uh, some people with some interventions rather than other people, people with other interventions, then of course uh, there are uh, serious gaps there that can undermine the, the process. And uh, whenever it's possible, I would say we should also involve community themselves in defining the, targeted, uh, the targeting uh, approaches. So if we, for example, uh, look at self self community self-targeting, uh, that are approaches that are particularly relevant, for example, whenever we look at asset creation, community-based projects uh, that uh, can benefit uh, different communities. Uh, in this case, the community can play an active role in defining the targeting approach itself, and we can mitigate the risk of uh, tensions. We should also give uh, ground to uh, communities, everybody in the community, to uh, um, file complaints. Uh, so we should provide the space for uh, re-evaluation of inclusion and exclusion allegations. Um, and uh, uh, also um, the language that we use, I would say, is very important. When we build our narrative of the crisis, we, we build uh, um, our narrative of protection issues, we should avoid, it's very tempting to use very alarming uh, language um, and uh, stress, I don't know, security related issues, for example. We should be conscious, uh, anyway, that uh, this uh, can fuel uh, inter-intra-community tensions. Uh, so perhaps we should avoid to say, I mean, to focus too much on uh, security issues, crime and the volatility of the security situation in and around the refugee camps. So of course, then uh, we provide uh, good uh, um, arguments to us communities to blame uh, displaced communities for uh, deteriorating the security environment, for example. So the use uh, of the language is extremely important. And also, I would say that uh, we should try as much as possible to uh, uh, focus on needs rather than status, and also adopt an, an area approach. So if we focus on status, saying, for example, uh, IDPs or refugees or migrants are uh, particularly vulnerable, for example, now I, on top of my mind, I have uh, the COVID-19 situation. If we say uh, migrants are uh, very vulnerable to get infected by COVID, then of course we, we uh, risk to fuel that kind of stigmatization, discrimination, and this can create, of course, intercommunity tensions. While we should focus on needs, and as much as possible adopt an area approach, which means that we target uh, everybody who has uh, the same kind of needs and who live in that specific geographic area. Um, Another thing I would say, whenever it's possible, we should uh, involve uh, um, host communities, local, local communities in our interventions, 
with assistance and uh, it's, it's possible also with the protection activities and uh, also create some venues for joint activities. Um, um, so we were saying uh, sometimes uh, tensions are uh, um, caused or fueled by lack of information, mistrust, uh, or also, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, conflict on limited resources. So if we create that space for, uh, community, uh, for, for members from different communities to come together and attend the same kind of activities, we build on existing, basically, connectors who are there in the community. We engage the, let's say, good willing people. I think even in the most hostile communities, we can still find good willing members who perhaps are also opinion leaders and who can lead by example and expand the level of consensus around that kind of activity that is a joint activity between involving members of different communities. This, of course, contributes to peaceful coexistence and uh, we can achieve also social cohesion uh, outcomes. There are some typical areas of, in, of intervention here, and I'm almost uh, uh, finished with this um, uh, intervention. I would say, uh, for example, we can look uh, at involving uh, um, uh, opinion leaders, religious, religious leaders uh, around uh, some uh, areas uh, such as uh, awareness rating uh, on uh, disaster risk reduction. And uh, in my mind, for example, now I have COP Bazaar and uh, activities that are implemented with the refugees and uh, Bangladeshi communities around disaster risk reduction with involvement of uh, uh, community leaders. We can involve the religious leaders from different communities around the joint uh, religious com com commemorations. We can, uh, around security, for example, yes, security is an issue that is particularly sensitive, but if uh, security issues are considered as a problem, uh, a shared problem by different communities, perhaps we can look at supporting unarmed civilian patrolling or community policing mechanism uh, involving uh, representatives from both communities to uh, take care uh, together of the security of their communities. Um, we can look at income generating activities involving youth and, uh, and women. Um, there are really uh, important entry points if we dig a bit and if we understand the, the, the local context to, uh, to let's say, work towards uh, um, peaceful coexistence and uh, social cohesion. Um, the last point is about communication. Yes, we should try as much as possible to combine assistance and uh, our protection interventions with an effective two-way communication uh, that as much as possible should be multi-sectorial and multi-agency. So um, establishing these venues for, uh, you know, receiving uh, complaints, requests, and uh, being able to not only address those requests, but also showing, uh, closing the loop, let's say, with, with communities, so showing programmatic adjustments once we receive a request and a complaint, it's important not only to act, but also to go back to the community and show that we have actually addressed that issue. This, of course, contributes greatly in terms of uh, building uh, trust, uh, accountability, and mitigate uh, tensions. Uh, it's important to map rumors and uh, uh, try to um, timely and accurately uh, address the, uh, those rumors. And, um, I would say that uh, um, behavior change also is uh, important. Behavior change uh, initiative, behavior change communication around uh, peaceful coexistence, social cohesion, uh, whenever it's possible, should be also uh, uh, be uh, included in the in the response. Over. Great, thank you, Andrea. And um, could I ask Melanie to to uh, come in on this as well, and then we'll jump over to a couple of examples. Over to you, Melanie. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a short point. Um, Andrea mentioned the importance of communication. Um, and it's, as you mentioned, it's not just about what we communicate, um, but also how we communicate. And linking it with his, po with his point on joint spaces, um, my experience, it can be quite important, if it's possible, um, to have good transparent communication in those joint spaces if there are already existing tensions between uh, different groups in your community. Because if you do important communication in separate spaces, in my experience, there can be actually a creeping suspicion between the, mem the groups um, that you tell one group one thing and the other 
don't well won't get the same information. Um, and that could then increase the risk of rumors and more tensions. Um, so paying attention to how we communicate in those um, instances and in what settings um, is equally important. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Melanie. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note. It's looking like we're going to be going over time, possibly by about 15 minutes. Um, so I hope that all of you are able to stay with us on the line, all of our participants. Um, if not, if you have to drop away for another meeting, you can, of course, access the recording afterwards. Um, but just a, a short note about that, that we are likely to go a bit over time. We have quite a bit more content that we want to make sure to, to cover here today. Um, so let us now look at a couple of examples of this general area of programming aggra aggravating tensions. We have seen a number of great examples actually coming through just over the last few minutes in the chat, looking at tensions um, uh, between host communities and, uh, and groups of, of refugees or IDPs. Um, we have some different kinds of examples that were submitted beforehand, so I'd like to share a couple of those. First, from a UN agency working in Madagascar. Uh, our participant writes, due to a lack of resources, we had to reduce the caseload and only provide food assistance to those who were estimated as most vulnerable. So in some villages, the population actually stood up as a whole to refuse the assistance because they said that all of them were in a diff difficult situation and they did not accept what they perceived as discrimination, where some would receive assistance and some would not. So we had to seek support from the government to explain the situation with these communities. Andrea, can I turn to you for your reflections on this interesting situation from Madagascar? Over to you. Sure. Well, we'll try to be <laughs> telegraphic here. Um, so I, I think here a problem is uh, um, the process that has been followed to uh, um, targeting and, and, uh, and prioritization and the way that expectations have been managed. I think, I mean, uh, we have limited resources and also sometimes a very specific and limited mandate, meaning uh, we target uh, only food insecure people, which uh, are things that need to be explained to communities since the very beginning, since the assessment phase. If we fail to do that, then of course we don't uh, uh, manage expectations properly. And then uh, there is a lot of space for misunderstanding uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, tensions can arise in this sense. So I would say uh, clarity since the beginning, uh, uh, and, uh, explaining uh, uh, the resources available and the uh, mandate of the organization. And uh, if it's possible, also, of course, uh, um, involve the communities in the definition of the targeting uh, approaches. So as I was saying before, uh, there are different possible targeting, targeting approaches, area targeting, community self-targeting, uh, vulnerability targeting. And so let's say if the community can participate uh, in, uh, in the process itself of defining the targeting approaches, then uh, the final uh, outcome uh, will uh, most likely not include uh, tensions. Over. Perfect. Thanks so much. And another example I'd like to throw your way, Andrea, for your reflections. This is coming from someone with a UN agency working in Erbil in Iraq. This touches on uh, the topic of the next webinar in this series, actually, which we'll be looking at coordination. So here we're seeing tensions arising from the method by which distribution lists are created. Uh, so our participant writes as follows, multiple organizations within the city used the same community leaders to get distribution lists, and as a result, the same households received multiple distributions while their neighbors did not, creating tensions. Andrea, what are your thoughts on this example? Over to you. Sure. Yes, I, I would say here there are two main considerations from my point of view. One is a lack of coordination between organizations on the ground, which is creating this, uh, this uh, problem that is described in the scenario, in the example. So, of course, if we don't talk to each other, if we don't coordinate, uh, we, there is a lot of uh, room for duplications on one side and gaps, of course, on the other side. And this uh, creates poor transparency and accountability uh, to uh, uh, communities and exacerbate and fuel uh, tension. And that, uh, another consideration is related again to uh, our um, over-reliance on real or alleged 
community leaders and representatives. Uh, sometimes we are lazy or uh, we don't have time and we just uh, uh, give uh, too much uh, trust and power to um, gatekeepers in the community who are everything but uh, representative of uh, the entire community. Of course, if we don't put in place check and balances, if we don't put in place proper screening and vetting, of uh, community uh, leaders and representatives that we uh, uh, work with, uh, there is uh, again room for uh, these kind of issues that are described in the, in the, in the example. Very last point, perhaps on uh, importance of uh, allowing or creating uh, appeal mechanisms. Uh, which means that if people are, have any uh, um, allegation about uh, uh, being or included or excluded in assistance, uh, there is a space for them to come to us and for us to address those uh, uh, allegations. Over. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. And thanks also to the participants who have submitted poll responses regarding their recommendations for how to approach situations where programming risks aggregate communal tensions. We're now going to move on to the fourth issue, and again, we'll be going a bit over time because we do want to ensure that we have plenty of time to discuss this fourth issue where protection services, either by their nature or the way that they are carried out, are putting people at risk. Um, so we framed this set of issues as follows. Um, protection services putting people at risk, the fact that we are providing protection services to people puts them at risk due to the nature of the services, including by uh, risking to stigmatize them in the community. And uh, to comment on this um, general area, I'd like to turn first to Sam. Sam, you have the floor. Hello. Thanks, Angrod. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this, is, uh, this can be one of the most sensitive uh, questions we have to deal with in the field. Um, so IRC works in protection in three areas, child protection, women's protection and empowerment, and protection and rule of law. Um, services and, and assistance for gender-based violence are often sadly one of the most sensitive things that we do and, and often uh, one of the things that uh, can get us in trouble with authorities and, and, and get us kicked out. Um, so that, that's on the access side. Um, and being able to maintain our presence and uh, operations. On the protection side, for people accessing these services, and um, I, I suppose there's an element of a do-no-harm uh, lens here, but that, that can be very, very difficult. Um, people who access services may be at risk of intimate partner violence back at home or social exclusion, exclusion from access to economic resources and, and, and similar as a result of accessing services, whether they're medical, psych psychosocial, legal um, assistance, and so on, and many forms of retaliation, not just community um, stigmatization, um, but uh, physical violence. Um, in with uh, protection um, services is that where there is a protection harm, there is a perpetrator. Um, so that dynamic is always going to be there and add a, a, a threat, um, not just a hazard, but a, a, a direct threat, um, potentially. So. I think uh, within that uh, and, and uh, that context and, and, and that framework of risks, we, we also need to have humility as humanitarian organizations about uh, in what ways and how far we can protect protection um, you know, for, for actors that, or, or people or um, external stakeholders that, that don't understand what we mean by humanitarian protection. Protection is a big word um, and uh, security forces, um, armed actors, armed groups, etc. they often see themselves as the people doing the protecting. So we have to be careful and sometimes there's an idea, uh, including from humanitarian actors, that even on a very individual level we can provide safety, uh, like safe houses for example, or that local authorities can, can guarantee protection. But it's often not the case, uh, either because the authorities don't have the training or, or, or the will, or, um, or frankly because the authorities are not there, that they, they have collapsed. Um, or because of the, the way information flows in communities, um, or that armed forces, armed groups, political actors are responsible for violations, um, so many reasons. So we have to be very careful, I think, what we promise, uh, very careful uh, in, in expectations, um, and, and work with a, a sense of humility um, uh, in, in, in this area. Um, 
one thing we've done before in, in terms of thinking through some ways to approach it is, and I'm sure many um, organizations here have done similar, is embedding or bundling such services in broader programs or facilities um, or, you know, in a framework that is contextually socially acceptable, whether that's within primary health facilities and services, uh, for example, or, or, or um, other, um, other methods. So it's not foolproof and has risks too, but we, we've been able to use that very successfully in uh, a number of contexts. Um, and of course, always listening and responding to clients. Uh, how do they perceive their safety? What do they need? What solutions could we work on together? Um, how do they want to access services that, that, that is the way that is comfortable for them? And then the third part is, uh, I think there is a public outreach component. I think uh, advocacy, uh, it, it is possible to build and develop community acceptance and support for more sensitive services over time. Working with uh, community champions, building trust, um, being credible as an agency and, and doing good work and showing our integrity um, too. So where we can change the environment and, and uh, reduce um, sensitivity or stigmatization of, of such services, that's another um, approach as well. Typically that's going to take uh, you know, more time, but something that can be worked on in um, parallel. So over a few uh, opening thoughts on, on, on this uh, large topic. Perfect. Thanks for that, Sam. And Mohammed, before we get into the specific issues, did you want to come in on the, the general introduction to this issue? Uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I would like to talk a little bit that uh, sometimes the uh, doing protection standalone program uh, uh, by itself can, can bring a lot of risks because there might be a lot of attention to it. That's where there are three modalities of you we do in protection, where the mainstreaming or safe programming is the basic for everyone, protection and non-protection. It's also important to consider that integration can be our best uh, uh, solution sometimes. So as Sam mentioned, where you integrate sometimes in primary health center, that's particularly important, for example, when you talk, when, when we talk about uh, specialized services, child protection services that can be very sensitive. You can integrate it, exam for example, in a nutrition programming where it might uh, more or less dilute that sensitivity and that risk. S uh, same for gender-based violence programming where we can integrate it in health or reproductive health programs. Having a case manager that works with the health uh, 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 worker in a facility, for example, in order to meet the women or meet the person that are at risk, talk to them, try to see how to link them, how to refer them in a very safe uh, manner. Work with the non-protection colleagues in our organization, for example, try to strengthen an internal referral system where they can identify a protection issue. So a protection by itself doesn't have to be the main umbrella that is seen by everyone uh, and that might create risk. No, we can actually rely on other sectors and we work with them. And I think that's very important to realize when we say risks because of, 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 of because of the nature of protection, sometimes we need to think, do we need to go very bold and say this is a standalone protection or it's better we integrate with, a, let's say, a, a less sensitive uh, programming, for example. Over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Mohammed. So now we have a few examples. I'm going to um, uh, be asking you, Sam, to, to comment briefly on these, and then I'm saving one for the end where I think uh, everyone has some comments uh, to make. So first, let's move through uh, to this first brief example of this type, which concerns a situation when the context requires access to registration services to be through the local courts. So our participant with an INGO in Iraq writes, Family members with a member, uh, families with a member associated with extremist groups were at risk while passing through checkpoints when going to local courts to get their civil documentation. Um, it's not a complete, uh, complete scenario, Sam, but um, based on what we do have here, what would be your reflections um, that you would share with, uh, with the individual facing this, this kind of concern? Over to you. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm uh, a little bit familiar uh, uh, with this scenario, um, which uh, applied in Iraq and, and, and also um, Syria uh, as well, um, although non-state security forces. Um, 
and and I, there's probably people on this call that have interacted more um, directly with with uh, this scenario, which um, and, and may have more recommendations than me. I think um, it's really tough. I mean, and, and in Iraq and and in places where security forces are um, powerful um, and uh, and there's huge, um, I mean, not just domestic. Uh, interest in, 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 in the issue essentially being referred to here, but internationally, um, this, this is an um, issue. Uh, what what uh, happens of, to, with, with families that have been associated or are perceived to have been associated with um, some of the groups in, in question. So um, very, very hard to, um, I mean, it's not, it's not something you can really work around. Um, those checkpoints are there, um, the security forces are there, um, it, you know, there's a hard force. Uh, the law, the political and public opinion. Um, there's a lot that's not in favor of, of resolving this scenario. I think the first thing I would say is uh, know the law really, really well. Um, in countries uh, where there is rule of law to a degree, um, that's always a starting point. It's not necessarily going to give the answer, but you don't want to get caught out by not knowing it. Um, know the bureaucracy, know what paperwork is required. So if, if there is paperwork that you can have for getting through these checkpoints, are there procedures where you can have a reasonable guarantee of safe passage and so on. Um, do them. So you know, do the due diligence. Don't don't get um, caught out by um, things that you, you, you've forgotten to do. Um, obviously, ultimately, here the, the the risk is to the families um, themselves. Um, so it's important they have a, a an understanding. Um, and then another way is: are there other ways to access the courts? Um, can you have a legal uh, appointee, a legal representative, uh, uh, legally? Um, appointed to the um, to the case that can actually go and do the travel and do the paperwork without the family, for example, having to do that. Um, can you do uh, uh, as uh, Mohammed, uh, my colleague on the panel, has just suggested, uh, mobile uh, legal aid um, as well? So, um, yeah, I think getting into the details on this one: are there alternatives uh, travelling to the courts? Um, know the know the law, know the bureaucracy, and and then really your final um, option is advocacy. Uh, and try and uh, ensure that there is a safe way for, for these processes to happen. Um, there will always be risk, especially where there may be uh, contested power or, or unclear chains of command between political, uh, legal, and security authorities. Um, yeah, sorry, not very positive uh, answer there. Some, some ideas, but very, very tough uh, example, that one. Certainly a tough example, but I but I think some some good practical suggestions actually. So thank you so much for for that. Um, we've also received multiple examples of how protection services to GBV survivor survivors and the LGBT community, or the way that humanitarian actors are able to access these communities, are leading to protection risks. So I'll, I'll just read out two examples here. One from an INGO in Sri Lanka, who writes. Since we run GBV project, when we contact some people, community the community um, generates rumors that these people are survivors of GBV at home, and they are stigmatized. And then a uh, second example from someone with an INGO in Lebanon writing, for services in particular to the LGBT community and to SGBV survivors, we risk putting more attention on those receiving services as neighbors start asking why you and not me are receiving visits from humanitarian actors. So back to you, Sam, for your thoughts on, on this type of challenge. Over to you. Yeah, um, there's a similar uh, theme in both of these examples um, in that communities or neighbors are um, seeing uh, aid workers going to particular places and knowing the services that those aid workers are providing. Um, and I think in that is the answer to this question, which is um, make it, uh, how, how, how can you, you know, make it uh, less obvious? Um, if, if, you're going to, if, if you're going to individual houses and you're known as an organization that uh, offers DBV services, um, that's pretty obviously signaling what, 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 what's going on. Uh, not saying that necessarily the, in these examples uh, they're, they're kind of wearing project T-shirts and caps, for example, um, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's clearly um, possible for communities and neighbors to identify the situation. So what I would say is think about other ways of uh, accessing, having people able to access your services or to know about them. Um, uh, can you set up facilities where people can come to you? 
um, and, and present those uh, facilities in a contextually appropriate way? Can you set up online or telephone uh, counseling? Um, uh, can you uh, deliver leaflets to all of the neighborhoods in the house advertising uh, services to all of them? And then people can come and find you. So thinking about how people access your services and, and what the, the visibility is to others um, is, is, is part of it. Um, and then I would also say, I, I don't obviously know about these particular projects, but um, the, the examples give a sense of going out to find people. Um, I think in, in many contexts, you need to allow people to come to you, um, make sure the services are known about, and, and let people come to, to you. Don't sort of be rushing to find um, uh, people um, for, because you have a proposal to write or a grant to deliver. Um, don't just go and, and talk to the community leader and say, where are all the um, survivors, um, for example. Um, another technique for identifying, so obviously apart from offering services, there's, there's a uh, need to identify people here, um, but snowballing. So going from house to house and asking, look, are there people we should be worried about, uh, and so on, can be another way of uh, finding information in a more um, sensitive way. It may take longer, it may take uh, more time, um, but uh, it's balancing off obviously there with the risk to, to individuals. So those are a few, uh, a few thoughts. Okay, excellent. So I think uh, let's, in the interest of time, let's skip ahead to example 4.4. .4. Uh, so this is um, uh, looking at protection needs assessments, which is another area where there are potential risks to the people participating in them. Uh, so we have an example from someone with an INGO in Colombia who writes, in our questionnaire, we had sets of protection questions, which we chose to remove as we could not guarantee the privacy of the interview remotely. We did not want to put those answering the questions at risk. We are now favoring referrals for certain groups rather than relying on some of our previous tools. Uh, so let me turn first to Mohammed on this one. Over to you, Mohammed. Assessments generally can be problematic in many conflict or many situations, especially protection assessments and whenever you have protection. Because at the end of the day, we try to assess or monitor deprivation, violence, coercion, and those and those threats are linked to, to, to people with, with power, sometimes people that perpetrate the law sometimes, or the rights of the individual. So it's, there is always a consideration of any, any assessment or monitoring tool that we are trying to do to make sure that it is safe. And, and that's where particularly I would go back to the concept of integration, where if we can, if we have other colleagues that are able to collect information related to, to, to food, for example, or shelter, or trying to assess an infrastructure that can be an, something easier or, or uh, might put people at lower risk. We can include some of the questions that we want uh, to, to monitor or we would like to assess. Uh, so we include in their assessments uh, that and then we analyze that internally as protection team, for example, and see what is relevant for us. The other thing, in many situations, actually, you cannot even hold a paper with you when you want to assess the situation. Uh, all the protection environment. It's very important here to work with our teams and one of the main skills that we need to, to build our teams on, build the capacity of our teams on, is the observation. How can they observe? How can they uh, see what is going wrong? And it's related to protection and to the people's rights, for example. That's also very important. I mean, at least in Yemen, we rely a lot on observation, for example. Uh, the other thing that I would like to, to, to talk about here is it's very important to sometimes also consider where an assessment by itself for protection, for example, is not very uh, uh, relevant, like the example that we have, uh, that it might create uh, more risk for the people. It's very important if we think how can we monitor the situation or the environment instead of monitoring the threat. So an example to clarify uh, this point is that so let's say we want to monitor issues related to child recruitment, but we cannot ask direct questions on this. We cannot meet the children, we cannot meet their parents, we cannot have direct information. 
It's important here to monitor other aspects, to monitor the environment itself. See, are there checkpoints, flying checkpoints? Were there any reports of detention for children? Look into, for example, livelihood opportunities in that community and how the children are, are coping with that and their families, of course. And also looking into, for example, education facilities. Talk to teachers, uh, have key informants with teachers on edu education itself that might reveal something related to child recruitment. So sometimes we cannot ask the, the direct question. We need to use more proxy questions for that to help us. And, and that's where uh, protection can be flexible and same time really a uh, tricky sector, to be honest with you, because if we cannot directly do that, but we need to keep considering that it can be to a certain extent everyone's responsibility and we can rely on other sectors and other colleagues. Over to you. Great, thank you, Mohammed. And as I think this is the last example we'll be looking at today, I'd just like to thank you as well for taking the time to be with us on the panel today. It's really been a pleasure and um, extremely informative, everything you've been able to share with us. So, so thanks so much for that. Um, now, Andrea, could I turn to you as well on this example related to protection needs assessments? You have the floor, Andrea. Thanks. Uh, no, I mean, Mohammed uh, definitely said extremely important uh, um, points. Just uh, perhaps to add on that, uh, on the importance to train enumerators on protection, conflict-sensitive, sensitive, verbal, and also not verbal communication, especially psycho uh, psychological first aid is very important, active listening and non-verbal communication. So sometimes very important uh, and relevant protection information is uh, contained in non-verbal communication. So it's not only important what people say, but also what people don't say. Uh, and um, so that is important. Uh, I think also the use of proxy indicators is extremely important. So sometimes we don't really need to ask uh, if uh, in an household there is a child labor or uh, early marriage. We can ask questions questions such as the number of working family members and the de dependency uh, ratio, the daily habits and occupations of children in the household, which can give us a good proxy indication about uh, child protection issues, for example. And then uh, the last uh, closing uh, note from my side is uh, to have a very critical uh, um, uh, self-reflection whenever we collect uh, protection-sensitive information in certain environments. We really need to understand if we can act upon the information that we are seeking to collect. If the answer to this question is no, and in environments like this when we already face the problems even just in collecting information, it's very likely that we would not be able to actually implement any protection, any meaningful protection intervention there. So if the answer to the question is can we act, uh, we cannot act in this, we cannot operationalize the information, the protection information that we collect, then we should not collect the information at all. So it's important to uh, minimize uh, the information on a need to know, strict, uh, rigorous need to know basis, and uh, conduct a cost-benefit analysis of uh, collecting uh, sensitive information. Over. Thank you, Andrea, and thanks also to you for taking the time today. It's been terrific to have you on the panels. We really appreciate uh, all of your contributions. And uh, Melanie, now over to you on this example 4.4, and then, of course, any other um, uh, closing uh, thoughts that you want to share before we close. Over to you, Melanie. Thank you. Um, Andrea and Mohamed have already mentioned a lot of important points on the specific examples. I just wanted to pick up on one specific point I understood from the example, which is um, the colleague who shared the example mentioning um, the remoteliness. Um, so I understood that maybe it was um, interviews for protection assessment being conducted remotely, maybe by phone. Um, and of course, that adds another level uh, of challenges to it. Because um, if we do it over the phone, um, we are not, as they mentioned, they mentioned the privacy, it's like we, we are not sure who might be listening in. Um, is someone sitting next to the interviewee, uh, maybe a husband if we're talking to a woman, um, or some other family member, is someone walking by if they're sitting outside? Um, so I think that that's definitely things that we need to consider. Um, 
when we look at remote uh, assessments, and I think this is especially at the moment with uh, the COVID-19 crisis and uh, many of us being forced to do more remote programming and remote assessments, um, a really important question. And also doing it remotely, um, how can we deal with disclosures and the nonverbal communication um, that Andrea mentioned? Um, it's almost impossible. It's not impossible, of course, if we do it over the phone. So doing remote um, assessments um, where it's yet another level of, of risk analysis. All right. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Melanie. Um, thanks to you for taking the time to be on the panel and for sharing uh, all of your analysis, reflections on the examples. Tremendously helpful. Now, last but not least, I'd like to give the floor over to you, Sam, for, again, uh, any reflections on example 4.4 and then anything else you'd like to share before we close. You have the floor. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, I, and uh, I had exactly the same uh, uh, take as um, Melanie on this one that, that there's a specific question uh, or aspect here about the remote nature of the interview or, or, or the assessment um, and that certainly uh, adds another dimension and, and especially uh, again in the current global context that's going to be applying in many 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 more places so uh, I would just say two things one um, you know get uh, expertise on the technology um, there are some secure technologies that can be used and deployed um, and, and get get advice on on cyber security and protecting uh, uh, that. Um, it is uh, it is possible. I know there's a lot uh, in media about hacking and so on and so forth, but, but there's a lot of uh, specialist knowledge that goes into what's uh, safe and what's not. So that uh, on the one end, um, and on the other, yeah, as Melanie said, uh, there are human risks as well because even if you have secure technology, at the other end, uh, there may be someone else there and so on and so forth. So understanding those. Um, and in different contexts, there's going to be a scale of risks uh, and a spectrum of options to, to, to put together. So um, I think there are possibilities, um, but uh, yeah, it's going to take a little digging around to see what's going to be appropriate and safe in the context. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. And um, once again, thanks so much for being part of our panel and uh, for taking the time. And I'm very much aware that, that we did go over time, but it was um, very important, I think, to be able to cover all of these examples and particularly to end on this one um, regarding needs assessment and also that r remote dimension, which uh, several of you point out may be the kind of situation that we'll all have to be dealing with even more uh, now in the COVID-19 Era. So a great discussion to end on, um, some very important points, a very rich discussion. And I'd like to thank, uh, again, not only the panel, but also all of the participants who contributed very actively in the chat, the polls, and the Q&A. Um, there will be a recording of the event, both in video and audio only podcast format. As I mentioned, this will be available on the event page in the coming days. So if you have colleagues as well who you think might benefit from listening to the recording, please do feel free to share that link uh, with them. Also, as mentioned in, in the beginning, this event was the third in a series of four events on access and protection. The final event in this series will take place two weeks from now on June 25th when we'll be discussing issues concerning the coordination of access negotiations and protection as well as CIVMIL coordination. If you missed the first event in this series, which introduced the concepts of access and protection and then looked in particular at issues related to COVID-19, a recording of that one is available. If you visit the event website, you can also find a recording of the second session in which we looked at concrete examples of negotiating access for humanitarian protection. Then finally, you can also continue the discussion in the PHAP online community. There has already been a lot of discussion among participants in the community on this topic, and I hope that you'll continue in this channel until our next live event. So with that, once again, I'd like to thank everyone, panelists and participants, for a very interesting discussion, as well as the teams behind the scenes who have made it possible to put on this event today. Thanks. This is Anne Herod Lang signing off from Geneva. See you next time.